I'm David Scare, a longtime instructor, Concordia Theological Seminary here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, the pericope, uh, the gospel for the epiphany, is Matthew chapter 2, uh, which is familiar to all of you. So that needs no, uh, that needs no further reading. So we will take a look at the Greek text and point out the significant things here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the I think the first thing to notice, by the way, is in the first verse, there's a reference to Herod the king. Now, that's worth a sermon in itself, insofar as he is one of the most significant figures of the ancient world. Uh, the, the second thing is, you will notice that in contrast to the question of the wise men, the Magi, where is he born king of the Jews? Herod is not called the king of the Jews. He is simply called the king. He's an Edomite by, by birth. He's a Roman by citizenship. He's a Greek speaker. And um, he is a Jew only because it, uh, only because it comes uh, that was necessary to be the king of Judea. Uh, <clears throat> there are many books on him. He's a fascinating figure, and uh, it may be worth your while just to add a little color to your Bible class and to your preaching to get one of these books. Um, he he was on the side of of he was uh, he was he, in the in the controversy controversy over who was going to succeed Julius Caesar. He was on the side of Anthony, and uh, he was defeated by uh, Caesar Augustus or Octavius, which was his name, and uh, he pleaded, Herod pleaded with Octavius that uh, he would be as loyal to him as he was to Anthony and that he could be trusted. And so he was, he was consumed by his loyalty to the Roman, to the Roman emperor. And uh, he is the, built, the temple, the Jerusalem temple, which he extended and built as one of the most my, perhaps the most extravagant building of the ancient world. He also built a temple to Caesarea uh, to Caesar in Caesarea, and he had built. He was a patron of other temples. Now, um, it's significant that the evangelist does not say, uh, does not say he's the king of the Jews, simply because Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. Well, when we say a Jew, Jewish audience, we mean a, a Greek-speaking audience, because everybody in those days was already speaking was already speaking Greek, and that is to this is the contrast between Herod, who is the false king, over against Jesus, who's the true king. Now that's already been established by the genealogy of the first chapter. Herod is very cognizant of. Uh, the fact that he is, is not really a, a Jew and that he is not entitled to the throne. And he has destroyed all of the records of the, of the genealogy uh, so that no one would know about them. Uh, that brings up the question, is then how does Matthew know the genealogy? Well, that's, can, that question can be discussed. Maybe Joseph himself was aware of it. But Herod does not want anybody to know that he's not really a, a true Jew. Now it comes right here. It says they come from the Anatole, uh, from the east, which is another technical term for Turkey and so forth. We don't know where they came from. Uh, it's not unlikely that they, they maybe have just only come from Samaria. Um, the command of Herod to kill all children who are two years and under, it should be interpreted that he kill, uh, gave the command to kill all children who had not reached their second birthday, which means it was children were killed under one year and uh, under one year of age. And uh, therefore, the idea that they traveled two years, and this way we can know how far the Magi came, and that's not really true. I mean, if what, whatever the distance was, it was not as if it took that long. Uh, 
the, the significance of the Magi coming from the east is because Matthew will say, say that many will come from the east and the west, and the Magi are already coming. And this passage can be understood over against what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, to make disciples out of all pagans, because right here the first persons to acknowledge who Jesus is are not the Jews, especially Herod, and, uh, uh, but, they are, but they are Gentiles. Matthew is a genius in doing that. Now, well, that's a theme that can be uh, developed into a, into a sermon. Now, they come to Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, if uh, they, they, are, uh, they are assumed to be scholars, and they are, uh, they do not know that Jesus is to be born in Bethlehem. They do know that Jerusalem is the capital city, which may indicate that Samaritans, because uh, uh, they're Samaritans, because the Samaritans only hold to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Notice this phrase right, this phrase right here. Where is he, the Basilaos, Ton, Udion? Where is the king of the Jews? Now contrast that with Herod up there, who is simply called... Um, are called a king. Now, uh, this is, I don't know about you, but, uh, oh, it's been several years now, maybe 15 or 20 years or so, that I've been to a uh, planetarium uh, to see the Christmas uh, show, and w what star that really is. And many times you spend your 10 or $15 only to find out that the seat sl sl uh, slides backward and you fall asleep. So you're paying an expensive price for a a nap. But there was the question is, what is this star, the star in the east? And nobody knows for sure. Dale Allison suggests very convincingly that uh, maybe the star in the east is an angel. Well, that seems to be preposterous when it says the morning stars rejoiced at the creation. It refers to uh, the angels. And um, that's, that's, that's always a good topic for a, a, for a Bible class. I'm fascinated by the, by the whole topic. But we have seen his star in the east. May have indicated that they had a special revelation of, uh, of uh, some type. It's, um, the traditional interpretation is that this is a fulfillment of the numbers in the prophecy made by Balaam that a star and a scepter shall come up, and that, shall, uh, that, uh, and, uh, and that seems to be convincing. Notice here again the word east shows up, anotole, which is a technical ter term for the geographical area of Turkey, but that doesn't apply. Anotole simply means the rising, the sun. It doesn't mean they saw, it doesn't mean we saw in the east the star. It says, while we, were, while we were in the east, we saw the star. It does not refer to the position of the star, but it refers to where they were when they saw the star. So it has nothing to do with how the, the configuration of, of the sky or of the heavens. Now this here becomes a very significant word, proscenero. We have come to worship him. Now, here even some Lutheran commentators don't grasp the significance of the word. It's going to appear again at the end of the pericope. They fall down and they worship him. Um, it, it means that they, uh, that they recognize the deity or the divinity of the, uh, of the child they have come to worship. Very important in Lutheran theology that we simply do not worship God, but we understand Jesus to be God and that he is to be worshiped. Right here you have, in this account, you, have, you already have complete faith in the, in, the, in the person of the wise men who are Gentiles. And that's contrasted with the Jewish population of, of Jerusalem. And uh, the editor, the evangelist, is really significant. I mean, he's really, he knows how, I like him very much. He knows how to handle things because, you know, make disciples out of all nations, 
And you all know the word pasa, all. Now, this doesn't say, it, this doesn't say that simply Herod was upset. Etachyate, he was upset. No, all Jerusalem was with him. Now, this is a condemnation. The evangelist knows what he is doing. Remember, his gospel is, dedica- uh, is, is directed to the Jews, but it's also directed them in a condemnatory way because they are the ones who have not accepted Jesus. I mean, in the gospel of John, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So it wasn't simply that Herod was upset, but the people were upset. And why were they upset? Well, while they, while they tended to complain about the Roman rule, because uh, uh, Judea was a province under Rome. It was a kingdom. It was a separate kingdom at that time. It would later, with Pontius Pilate, become a province. But it was a separate kingdom. That was a very nice, that was very a nice arrangement for them because they were allowed to conduct business as usual. I think the best example might be Quebec in Canada. It's under the British rule, but for uh, 200, 250 years, They've been allowed to have their own culture and religion and their schools. Notice it says, all Jerusalem, all Jerusalem with him right there. And the, the, the issue was there is that life was going to be disrupted. Now, here comes the point, and that is wherever Jesus comes, wherever Christianity comes, there's a disruption. It would be much better if Jesus hadn't come, uh, if Christianity would not be established, uh, nobody, uh, everything would go on as it did before. Uh, the the uh, Jews had, all, had compromised already, had been compromised by Herod and the, and the Roman occupation. There was a Roman eagle on the side of the temple, on the one side of the temple. Roman, a Roman guard was in the tower of Antony looking over the temple. So it was, but the Jews were quite happy they were content with that situation. At least it gave them security. And then comes this, it, uh, Herod's ignorance. Uh, it comes out in this thing. Uh, here's a good word for synagogue, synagogon. He gathered, he gathered, now he just didn't gather the high priests and the scholars it says he gathered all of the scholars now this is translated sometimes chief priests archaeologists i see no reason why that can't be translated high priests that's why um, some people ask they some ask why the question of why we look at greek and the answer is uh, sometimes the english uh, doesn't really quite get it this it's the same word for chief priests and high priests And this would indicate that the highest religious authorities were involved in this. And the scholars of the people, the scholars of the people, um, they were uh, to to find out where the Christ would be born. Uh, This indicates if Herod had been brought up as a Jew and he was not, he would have known the prophecy about Bethlehem. And if he didn't know the prophecy of Bethlehem, he would have known that the son of David uh, that uh, would follow in David's footsteps, and that B- David, uh, that Bethlehem was the royal, royal city. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to use the hymn, "Once in Royal David City." Very good hymn, certainly carries the message. And I came across this material that, that could spice up the sermon a little bit, and that there is a movement, among the Jews, to give the uh, ruler, the chief executive officer of the. Uh, the modern state of Israel, the title, the son of David. He could even be a king. I don't know if that's going to come through, but the phrase, the son of David, uh, the son of David carries, has the implications of everything that involved David. And also, uh, it explains what it means when the crowds cry Jesus to Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. They answer in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, uh, prophet saying. Now, one of the strange things about this passage 
is that Matthew adds this word right here. It's negative in the extreme. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah. Now, that's not in there, by the way. But it does indicate that the, uh, the writer is pointing to um, uh, is pointing to the people in Judea. Uh, in my estimation, and I think it's very defensible, that while scholars hold the Gospel of Matthew was written towards the end of the first century, maybe even later than the year 100, and that is uh, these uh, references, quite explicit, uh, would have little meaning, like land of Judah, after the year 70, because uh, that whole area was uh, destroyed, decimated, uh, left in ruins. Uh, among the governors of Judah, uh, uh, out, out of you will come forth he who is the leader, uh, the ruler, the hegumenos. One doesn't want to use the German word fearer, but it comes close to it. Uh, who'll, who will be a shepherd of my people, Israel. Now, we generally connect the thought of the good shepherd with the gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. But notice here, the, uh, the thought is introduced right in the birth narrative of Jesus. He will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. And of course, that brings up the concept of Israel too, of uh, the, the concept of David. Uh, the, the, of course, in John, we have I am the good shepherd. But in Ezekiel, you have a, a combination that both God and David will be the shepherd of the people. The term la'as, you know, la'as is used. That means people. But it deliver, it, it, in a particular way, it means uh, the people, the people of Israel. Now, you could say, well, I find this a fascinating topic, and you can only do it in Matthew, I think, is the way he quotes the Old Testament. And here is an example where he takes a positive set, a sentence, positive in Micah, you Bethlehem, uh, uh, you, uh, you Bethlehem uh, are, are the least, even though you are the least, among the rulers of Judah, yes, out of you will come forth. He adds the word not right here. He adds the word not right here. But really, I don't know how you would express, express the word not in, 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 in an even more absolute way. Well, what has happened, by the way, the, the prophecy, Bethlehem, you're, you're an absolutely nothing city. But yet from you will come the, grand, the great ruler. That passage changes the meaning. That pa the meaning of the passage now changes because Bethlehem is no longer the least, but it's not the least because out of it comes God's ruler. Uh, then Herod calls the, uh, the Magi. There's a lot of speculation of who these people were, and that's fine. It here's your word accurately, acribone, to determine exactly. See the word acribone here? Acribone. From them, the time of the appearance. And by, here we get pretty close to the word epiphany because epiphany means the, means the shine. I don't know if you really have to put that in a sermon, shining. But here you actually have the word shining. Which, which then is included in our word epiphany, the shiny, the appearance of the star. We can go down. We can go down now to the next one. Can we lower it a little? Can we see the next verses? Good. Thank you. That's good. So he sent them to Bethlehem. Uh, notice the same word. To accurately find out, look, same word as this one right here. Concerning the child. Hear the word pediatrics, pidone, right here. Uh, when you find him, tell me, it's almost, almost gospel, <laughs> proclaim the gospel to me, and I will come and worship him. Now, I'm not that big on the preaching about the Antichrist, but this would be an opportunity for those of you who are so inclined, 
because Herod now presents himself, I think now I may be beginning to sound like Luther, because Luther could find a, a lot of material in a particular, look, he says, Herod, Herod wants to go and worship Jesus. Now consider this. Herod knows he's an imposter on the throne of David. And what is the Antichrist? The one who pretends to be a Christian, but not only is not a Christian, but opposes Christianity. Now maybe that is not the best theme for Epiphany or Christmas, but it's there. I can't, well, that we, that we can't, uh, that we can show. I, this, is, this word preskinello is a very important word because it's going to appear down here before, down here below. The wise men fall down and they worshipped him. Uh, here you have the reference. Oh yes, and here he, when the king heard this, they went away and they saw the star which was in the east and the, they saw in the east. No, they saw, yes it does. They saw in the east and led them to where the child was placed. Now a number of things here. Uh, Jesus was not born in an inn, a motel or a hotel. He was born in the room in the house beneath on the ground floor where they kept the animals. If you have visited certain farms in Austria and southern Germany, you'll see this kind of situation. Um, uh, uh, Jesus is now perhaps uh, six, I would say uh, six months, between six months and a while. And you know, at that time, little nice, little, and I think it's okay to preach this. It's that time when helpless little infants begin to express themselves by rolling over, by eating, by trying to get up, and all kinds of good things. They opened up their gifts. They opened, oh, they opened up their treasures. Now that's an amazing word right here. They opened up their treasures, which <laughs> indicates that these are very expensive things, whatever they had. So maybe they were not kings. Of course, you know, at Christmas time, we hear the same song and dance that we don't know if there were three magi and they weren't kings and okay, so forth. I don't know how valuable all that stuff is. Um, but whatever it is, th these men had money. They were highly placed. It's an amazing, I don't think in preaching the story of the wise men that we grasp the significance of the story for this reason. Okay, you have the birth. The birth of Jesus really does not take up much of, much of Matthew at all. You really have this conception of Jesus and the problem that Joseph has, that Mary is pregnant with a child that Joseph does not know. That's the whole thing. The child is born, and Joseph gives him the name. It's pretty cut and dry stuff. All of a sudden, it is almost as if Matthew goes from drive into reverse gear. He changes gears. It is absolutely... Not a shocking thing, but there is no easy way. No, I'm sh in sermons, I don't think we, should have, we need to have transitional sentences. All of a sudden, the worst kind of people show up, worse in the eyes of the Jews. These would be people that would not be permitted in the temple. And, and heaven knows what kind, of, what kind of pagan beliefs they still heard. Now, they could have come from Babylon, they come from some place where there's a Jewish population because they know something about the Old Testament. They all, they all know something about the Messiah. Whatever they know, whatever they know from the Old Testament, they aren't, they, they're, they're not ignorant. They know, they know that. They know that the Messiah is going to come from the Jews. And this story uh, serves as a bracket with the, the centurion who doesn't go want Jesus to come into the house. So the evangelist says, many shall come from the east and the west, but the sons of the kingdom shall be thrown into the outer darkness. It's an absolutely startling story. And I'm not so sure that in our preaching that we get what a 
utter contrast that this is that these gentlemen show up right into the narrative. They come from nowhere and they go to nowhere. Um, uh, 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 being troubled, oh yes, we want to look down, oh yes, we must look at this. They come into the house. This is not a main, this is, this is, this is not an inn, it's a house. The house belongs to Joseph or Joseph's family. He is the rightful owner or the, inher or the absolute inheritor of the house. He has already started business there. He and Mary expect to spend the rest of their lives in Bethlehem. Now, in Matthew's gospel, the, the first everything is about Joseph. The genealogy is about Joseph. The dreams about what to do with the child Jesus, they are about Joseph. Mary plays no part in the story at all as a speaker. She gives birth to Jesus, but she does not engage in any conversation at all. We don't know what she says in Matthew. All of a sudden, Joseph disappears. And they see, notice this, they see the Pideon, pediatrics with Mary, his mother. And here you have the first icon of the Madonna and child. Now, so one of my colleagues, great guy, he said, well, Joseph had gone back to Nazareth to work to get money to support them. Now, that's not what the meaning of it is at all. All of a sudden, the evangelist has pushed Joseph off the scene. It doesn't mean that he's not in the house it doesn't mean that he's not nearby. It does not mean that he in any way has deserted them. It has nothing to do with the geography of, of the situation. But when it comes to Jesus, the only person who matters is his mother. Now, it, uh, ch the child and, and Mary are not placed as equals. The child is at the center of the attention, and there Mary, his mother, is ancillary, but she is part of it. And you know that in the uh, Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they, they typically have uh, two icons. On the right, they have, as you enter the, sanctu uh, the Holy of Holies, uh, onto the right, you have Jesus as God, and on the other one, you have our, our Blessed Lady holding the child. Here it is right. Now, so the, 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 the idea of the Madonna and child which I don't know if it appeared on American Christmas uh, American postage stamps, United States poster stamps, but it's a it's a favorite piece of art for Christmas cards at this time of year, and there's where it comes from right here. They fell down. Now, here is where the word "prescanao" "prescane son" here is very significant. Cannot be ignored. It means to worship. It doesn't mean simply to lie down on the floor. Uh, that is handled by the word pesantas right here, which is the word pipto, to fall. Pesantas right here. That's a gerund. Falling down, they worshipped him. Now this, this combination of words were going to appear in the final temptation of Jesus, where the Satan says to Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. Now, uh, this has to be accentuated to our people because this country is strongly Calvinistic. Even the Methodists, they're, they're, they're a type of Reformed church. Now, there can be inconsistencies in how they preach and what they believe and how they write their hymns. I mean, Hark the Herald Angels Sing and uh, absolutely great, a great hymn. And it holds the book. But this is the significance. Calvin did not believe that the human nature of Jesus, that the man Jesus contained the deity of God, uh, the complete deity of God. And here you got to look at this. Worshipped, worshipped him. Not them. Notice the word, auto, singular. And they opened their gifts. And then um, being warned by a dream, uh, they, want, uh, they did not return to, uh, to Herod, but they went to their country. Here's the word. They, they went to their country in another way. Uh, you can note that 
in Luke's Christmas story, nativity narrative, there is no reference to dreams at all. Matthew does that, but that's uh, something for another time. <clears throat> you actually have enough t material here in Matthew chapter 2, 1 to 12, for several sermons. And um, Epiphany is always a kind of a letdown, but you have the major. Here you have the introduce, this introduction, not only of Jesus as God, but you have the introduction of Herod as the satanic figure. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you the best for a very happy and blessed Epiphany.